embark on a wonderful musical journey with the Super Bowl Gospel Celebration brought to you by Procter & Gamble. This is a one-hour syndicated program, a national program that will be aired throughout January the 28th. On today's show, we are bringing you the Media Roundtable. We are talking to you with media and also Tasha Wheaton. She's on board. She is our moderator. You don't want to miss it. We have Nate Burleson. He is the former NFL player and co-host on the CBS Morning Show. He will be hosting the Super Bowl Gospel Celebration. Stay tuned for that. Now, we do have on hand Melody Few. She's going to be speaking on 20 years of celebrating, finding the Super Bowl Gospel Celebration here in the entertainment capital of the world, right here in Las Vegas, Nevada, we want you to know that we like for you to come out on February the 7th for the Super Bowl Soulful Celebration with all the celebrities, all of the award-winning artists, the NFL Players Choir, and many more. Stay tuned because you're going to see highlights here on Val TV Network. This is the Media Roundtable with Tasha Whedon. Thank you once again. I want to begin this uh, conference call, this media roundtable today, promoting the Best of Super Bowl Gospel Celebration, airing in national syndication currently all over the country. Um, started on um, the 24th of this month and will be going until January 28th. So first I wanna begin by introducing our incredible executive producer and founder, Ms. Melanie Few, who has been carrying this um, vision uh, that she birthed uh, almost 25 years ago, um, you know, throughout the NFL and really making an impactful, impactful presence for the kingdom of God. And so, Melanie, we'd love to have you just talk about the origins of the Super Bowl Gospel Celebration and what inspired you to begin on this journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasha. And thank you to all the members of media who made time to participate today. Really appreciative. Um, just to give a little bit of background, I tell everybody um, how I came about, uh, how God gave me the vision to do the Super Bowl gospel celebration was, I tell people in my before Christ days, right out of college, <laughs> when I was partying real hard, I went to a Super Bowl and uh, I, I come from a, a family of ministers and I couldn't understand why there was no faith-based program or faith-based initiative around Super Bowl. And so after that Super Bowl, this was like 90, 18, 1989, 90, I, um, I wrote the NFL. I started writing them saying, I would love to do a Super Bowl event. And I'll tell people I got rejection letters for seven years in a row. And I, that's why I know the number eight is meaningful from a biblical perspective. It's new beginnings because I finally heard from them on the eighth year. And they said, we will give you a chance to do this Super Bowl gospel. You keep writing us about. Um, I was that little girl that when my parents told me, no, I just never understood it. And I used to have to get a spanking for them, for me to know that no meant no. <laughs> so, and so that's how this really all came about. I'm so grateful over these years we have grown. God has blessed this property. We started out airing. Um, and we started out airing on the gospel music channel that we went on to be with on BET for eight years in a row and uh, have had portions of the show also show on Amazon Prime and on the Bounce Network. And uh, for this 25th anniversary coming up, we will be on CBS, which is just a major milestone for our 25th anniversary. Uh, it's something we, we had, couldn't have even dreamed of. Uh, but God saw fit for us to be on the network that is actually carrying the game. And this is really brand new news because this is all happening in the last couple of weeks. And so uh, I just, like I said, I thank you all. This is a, 
this has been a faith walk and a faith journey. And I'm just grateful to be on this journey. And I tell you the truth, there's no way if the other people that you're going to see that will speak on this call, if it had not been for the love and the support of these people and many more, there's no way this particular initiative could have seen it to 25 years. And so I really want to take a moment and just thank uh, all the folks that are on this call, but also people who have been a part of this journey over these last 25 years. I could not have done it alone. When music and football team up, it kicks off the ultimate TV inspiration celebration. Get ready for the best of Super Bowl gospel. Super Bowl, Super Bowl gospel, Super Bowl gospel celebration. Coming in. The best of Super Bowl gospel celebration will connect diverse audiences to the brightest lights of the gridiron and meaningful music. All huddled up as the NFL's first and only sanctioned inspirational concert. Coming in hot. Your audience will see the biggest stars in the NFL, the gospel music world, delivering a family-friendly TV special. Guaranteed to uplift and elevate the human spirit. The dynamic content ranges from the Aspirational Faith in Action Award and Lifetime of Inspiration Award. Featuring the stories of NFL players fueled by their faith to make a difference in society and their communities. I take no award or achievement for granted. I love life and I live the life I love and I love the darn life I live. I think the best example of faith in action is application. So I feel like you have to be able to do both, but more importantly, you have to have integrity and stay true to yourself and what you believe. The key to success is to always keep a positive attitude and mindset. I know this past year has been more challenging than most. You know, I've been fortunate to win some awards, and for this one of the most important ones I've ever been able to win. The NFL Players Choir. A truly gifted performance group of former and current NFL players is celebrating its 16th anniversary and delights audiences every year. The best of Super Bowl Gospel Celebration will be a commemorative show with innovative performances from musical icons, superstar players, and celebrities. The best of Super Bowl Gospel Celebration. Game on. Thank you so much, uh, Rochelle, for sharing that video. And now we are going to go to our incredible host. We could not be more fortunate to have such an incredible talent lead us through this journey um, of celebrating the last 24 years of Super Bowl um, gospel celebration. And that is the incomparable Nate Burleson, um, CBS sports analyst, co-host of CBS Mornings, and just all around amazing child of God. Mr. Nate Burleson. <laughs> well, thank you for that introduction. I am not worthy of all that praise, but I'll receive it. Uh, yeah, I, I was blessed and fortunate enough to be involved in this as an athlete who has anchored himself on his faith, his family, and of course, football. Um, this is the great intersection of all of those things. And then you add in the music. We're talking the biggest artists, performers, speakers with the biggest testimonies. Um, and that's offering that to the world, to the viewers. Um, and it's been something that has happened every single year, as we talked about, on the biggest of stages, on the biggest weekend that we have to offer in sports. Um, you know, as a player, I recognize how many players in the league walk in their faith and are proud about their faith. Um, oftentimes, we don't share that enough and we don't highlight it enough. And this is that. It's highlighting that for everybody, for the musicians, the artists, the groups, the choirs, the speakers, the pastors, and everybody in between. Uh, I'm thankful that this is something that gives football and faith a place to shine just as bright as the Super Bowl does. You know, I'm, I'm an R&B head. I'm an 80s baby raised in the 90s and flew by the 2000s. Of course, I love hip hop, but my mother woke me up every weekend to clean the house to the Mississippi Mass Choir. So I understood from a young age um, that you don't just walk the walk, you praise and you praise with everything in you. So this is a great opportunity for me to highlight how there's a great intersection between artists and the music faith based sector and then what some would call secular sector um, and how that intersects in such a beautiful way. There's not too many genres that can do that, uh, but the Super Bowl Soulful Celebration does exactly that. 
So we are here to do that, highlight the last 25 years. And by highlight, I want to continue to emphasize that word because as we lead up to every sporting event, whether it's the World Series, the NBA Finals, Major League Baseballs, um, playoffs, the NFL's playoffs and Super Bowl, a big boxing event, we always show highlights of the athletes. I think this is beautiful because we are showing highlights of what has happened over the past 24 years as a reminder of what we've done, what we have accomplished, and then also what we can do moving forward. Incredible. Thank you so much for that uh, well-stated overview, Nate. And now we're going to go to one of the brightest lights of the Super Bowl gospel celebration. The award-winning artist uh, was given powerhouse performances on this show, Mr. Kaylin Carr. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Jacqueline. Can you just talk a little bit about what the experience of participating on Super Bowl Gospel Celebration has meant to you and has been like for you? It's, it's meant a whole lot to me. And I say that because when you can take Jesus to the marketplace and it's successful, Everybody get a chance to witness this. I, I, it doesn't get any better than this. I think it's a beautiful experience. I've had nothing but beautiful experiences being on uh, Super Bowl Gospel. And just to be able to be a part of something that reaches not just one sector of people, but the world. Um, and it's inspirational. It's encouraging, especially during everything that is going on, not just in the world, but in the in their very homes. Uh, but during that time where they can get football and they get some Jesus too, <laughs> I think it's so beautiful. And I have just been blessed to be a part of something that is so amazing. Thank you, Ja'Kalen, and thank you for joining us today. Now we're going to hear from another player. Um, you know, the NFL Players Choir has truly been one of the gems of the Super Bowl SoFo um, celebration. I'm going to keep flipping back and forth because it was initially the origins was Super Bowl gospel celebration. And so this special is about the best of that, but we have rebranded and going forward, uh, we will refer to the event and the show as the Super Bowl Soulful Celebration. So that said, uh, for the past 16 years, one of the jewels in the crown of this event has been the NFL Players Choir performance. Um, and so we're gonna hear from one of the guys um, who has been probably on this journey the entire way um, since its inception. And that is Mr. Brian Scott, um, who, you know, is one of the, the premier members of the choir and uh, a former NFL player. Brian, may we hear from you? Happy Thursday, everyone. <laughs> yes, it is just an honor and a blessing to be here. I cannot believe it has been that long, 24 years? What? Can you believe it? <laughs> I don't believe it. And the reason why I say that, so I'm telling my age, and Nate, you right there with me, sir. My rookie year was 03. And that was my first time taking part in the Super Bowl at the time, gospel celebration, Super Soulful celebration. And uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was in Houston. And, and going up on stage in one, just be sharing the stage, first of all, with the artists that you, you grow up listening to and you know, they, man, when I tell you, it was really music that brought me to the Lord and kept me there. And it, it's just such a huge part of my life, but I just can't believe it's been that long. So super excited for everything that has taken place and everything that's about to happen. But uh, I, I know I can speak for the fellas on this. You know, when the, when the choir was formed about 16 years ago, it really was that safe space. We recreated a locker room and it was that space for guys to be able to not just share their faith, but tell their testimony. And we understood because a lot of times when we are together, like we can't share to the world. People look at us as gladiators, but this was that space where we could open up and be very transparent, share that testimony. When I tell you the NFL Players Choir, it has saved lives, it has saved marriages, it has saved friendships. And so for that, we are beyond grateful for the vision of what it's been. Amen. 
Beautiful, beautiful. And so now it's our, our time uh, to be interactive. And for those members of the media that are here with us, um, what I would like you to do next is raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Sure. Uh, the name of the album is self-titled um, G. Kalen. And it's been four years since I recorded. And actually, the last time I believe I was on Super Bowl, I did You're Bigger. <laughs> um and but this album right here it's been four years since I've recorded one and I just felt like it was time during that time I had the opportunity to kind of know like where I wanted to go and, and all of that and also being okay with embracing the more that was in me um and not being not limiting myself to the full traditional thing just because that's what I've done, that doesn't mean that's all of who I am. And so this album, you get you get a few different styles. Um, and I also collaborated on this album as well. Kirk Franklin, Tasha Cobbs, Leonard Blanca, uh, Papa Sun, Elevation Rhythm. I'm missing a lot of people. Kier, Sheer Kelly, Tor <laughs> so many others. But anyway, it's uh, I would have to say it's, it's probably my favorite album yet. Um, and again, the name of it is Ja'Kalen. Thank you, Ja'Kalen. And we cannot be more excited to learn more and hear more from this new project of yours. Uh, <laughs> so with that said, we're going to go to our um, members of the media present. And we're going to call first on Chris Gunther, because I saw your hand up first. Chris, unmute and go with your question, please. Appreciate it. As always, Tasha, so great to see you. And hello to everyone. Thank you all for taking the brief time out. My question is going to be for Nate. Nate, you are somebody that is extremely well known in the sports world. You know, how are you able to make sure that you do not compromise your faith, especially with all the temptation that comes with your platform? Um, that's a really good question. By the way, you're looking fly. I like the way you, you oh, put appreciate together, it. You my know, brother. I looking found good, out looking I was good. talking to you today. I'm like, well, brother got to come correct. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you know, that's that's a fantastic question. And it's not easy. I will say um, the obstacles in my walk are just like everybody else's. It might just be that the mistakes that people in media make are magnified a little bit more because the eyes are on us. Um, I've always felt like there's certain compromises you have to make. Maybe one in your relationship with your wife and your kids because you want everybody to get what they want. Maybe a little bit on the football field because you can't always get the football. As a wide receiver, quarterback has to throw it, the linemen have to block, and everybody else has to touch the ball too. But when it comes to work and using my platform, that's not a place I'm willing to compromise. Um, I've seen people compromise for the wrong reasons, whether it was to go viral for the money, for a new deal, and I never wanted to be in that position. I'd walk away from any job that I have that it, if it felt like it was compromising my faith or my family. Um, and that's kind of what I stand on. And if I can wake up and go to sleep at night holding on to that, I know that I have done my family proud. I have represented the NFL, that's this brotherhood that I am part of. But then also at the end of the day, when I'm done and I leave my footprints behind for others to walk in, I want to hit those pearly gates and I want him to say my good and faithful servant, well done. So uh, these are things that you have to constantly think about, um, especially in the space that I'm in. I do believe that the NFL was a great launching pad for the rest of my life. And I'm thankful for that because there are a lot of my brothers that play that that was the last phase of their life. Um, for me, understanding what it takes to be an athlete on a team full of 53 guys from all walks of life and understanding that it's about coexisting together for one common goal um, and not making it about me um, has prepared me for all of these different spaces that I am in. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm an individual that's part of a larger collection, a congregation, if you will, as I take the stage on any show that I'm on, whether it's sports, news, or kids related. Um, and then that's what I think about on a daily basis. Um, I'm I'm just like every other man. I fall, but I quickly dust myself off um, and I make sure that I get right back on the path that I deserve to be on. Appreciate the time. And hey, thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Nate. We're gonna go to our next question from Ms. Partiz Smith. Go, go with your question, Partiz. Thanks, Tasha. My question is for Ms. Melanie Field, and uh, my question to you is, I've been following the Super Bowl Gospel, now Super Bowl, Super Bowl Sofa uh, celebration for, since it started in Indianapolis. I want to know, uh, my favorite show was in, in New Jersey, New York, at Madison Square Garden with Patti Bell, Donna McClurkin, and so many, I think Fantasia was at that one. I want to ask you, out of all the 25 years um, that you can recall, which one was your favorite Super Bowl gospel celebration? My favorite Super Bowl gospel celebration really had nothing to do with the talent. Um, it was actually in 2000 because it was in Atlanta. So it was a little bit before my mother passed, but she was there and both of my parents were there. And it's interesting because, you know, my parents came from a time where you, you know, you get a, you get a regular job and you retire in 50 years and that's that. So they just like, what you know, we put this girl through college and what is she doing? This is crazy. <laughs> you know. And my father would say, girl, would you just go get your teacher certificate and go sit down, Melanie, and we pay for your college degree. And it was like they didn't quite understand what I was doing. And I kept saying, this is my dream. And they both came in 2000. And, and the joy and the pride that was on their face. I honest to God, I can't even tell you who the talent was that year. Because wow. that's a moment I will always remember the way they looked at me. And, and my mother told me later, she said, I was too fearful to go after the things I really wanted to do. Because both of my parents were amazing and smart and brilliant. My mother was a school teacher and my father was president of the Atlanta Teachers Credit Union. But my mother was a creative. And she told me, she said, I'm looking at you different because you had the faith to, de to debate your father and I with respect but you, you you went ahead on and picked up the mantle that you feel God had for you. And she said, I always wanted to do something different than what I'm doing and I was too scared. And she that made her happy that I had stepped out on faith and done it. Hello everyone, as, as uh, Tasha just said, my name is Kimberly Thomas and I am with Wiser TV Network. My question, first of all, is to Melanie Few. Um, Melanie, um, with such a huge undertaking of an event of this magnitude, I just wanted to know how difficult was it to fuse um, gospel and the NFL together? Uh, it was difficult. I, I re received uh, seven years of rejection letters before they finally sanctioned me in 1999. So it was difficult, but I felt like I've always loved football and I felt like people see players and they don't take the helmets off of the guys like yeah. Brian, who is on this call today. Brian not only is a former football player, but he's a man of Christ. He's a talented musician and singer, and he's a really stellar businessman. Mm. And I don't know. I felt like I need I, I don't know. I didn't know whether it was going to be me, but I felt like somebody needed to take the helmet off and show what drives a lot of players in this it's their faith. Football is the only game in professional sports where players are much more open about their faith than yes. any other sport. And I just kept seeing the value in that. Cause I, even to this day to my, my little cousins, like when they found out Nate was gonna, you know, be the host. Oh, I am so cool. Now they haven't been paying me any <laughs> attention all year long. But they were like, neighbors, you know, and so um, I think it's important. And I also think it's very important for black males, young black males to see the faith side of professional football players, the ones that are amazing husbands, amazing fathers. Yes. I didn't know it was going to be me that God would say, you know, go do this, but I'm grateful. And like I said, it really hadn't even been about me. It's been about God and it's been about all the amazing people, which is a lot of folks that mm -hmm. have been on this journey. We've been on this ride together. And so I'm so grateful because we always say we, we might be riding on four flats, but we together. <laughs> um, but the question I have is, how do you feel gospel music has ultimately impacted the NFL? And how often uh, for the players itself, um, how often is gospel music heard in the locker room? 
So let's go to Nate first, and then we'll go to Brian Scott. Go with that question, Nate. Um, I feel like that doesn't get talked about enough, which is why uh, the Super Bowl gospel, Super Bowl soulful celebration is important to remind people that there are players that walk in their faith and walk out loud. Um, I would bet if you grabbed somebody's phone uh, before the game where they play all their music on, you would find a rotation of all kinds of music, right? You'd have hip hop, R&B, rock and roll, country, depending where you're at. But I guarantee you this, there is a gospel on majority of the guys' playlists. Um, and we have a rotation throughout the week. You know, we have the Mondays and Tuesdays. It's dominated by guys from the South because guys from the South are always in the NFL on every team because they play good football down there. And then we also have something called White Boy Wednesdays where whoever is a white boy that loves music, he's going to rock the, the ox and he's going to do his thing. But you will always have some type of gospel that works its way into the locker room, um, which is why I think it's important for people that watch this game and think it's just two brutes clacking helmets together. You have to realize we are always prayered up, whether it's during the week in the facility, before we eat, before the game, right before the game on the field. After the game, as we huddle together and bow our heads after the long battle of a game against our so-called opponent or enemy, we come together and we pray. He hit the nail on the head and, you know, Nate and I, we never played together, but how he was describing the locker room, it might as well have been the same locker room that I was in. Because, yes, you would have got, especially after training camp, getting through, <laughs> man, we would have gospel rocking on, on those speakers. And I think Nate's correct where it, it is not talked about a lot. But when you think about how often we did, you know, how, how um, it, it, it was there. So during the week, yes, we would have Bible study. We would go over to guys' houses and have Bible study. And then when you traveled on a Saturday night, you would have your mass in your chapel, right? And then on Sunday, yes, you would get to the locker room. And before you go out there, it was prayer in the shower. And there were so many guys there. You're talking about 53 guys that we would pack out the shower where it would have to overflow into the restrooms, right? And so this was a every given Sunday. And then, like as Nate said, after the game, then you kneel down in the middle of the field and you pray with your opponent who, you know, you say you just went to war with, but it wasn't about the wins and the losses. It was just the covering of the protection because it is a very brutal sport and you don't know what the outcome is going to be on a physical standpoint, not so much on the scoreboard. So you're praying for that. You know, you, you want those arms of protection to be around you, the family, the coaches and everything as you go on.